What's the deal with all these comedians that poke fun at women always going to the bathroom together? I know you know what I'm talking about. I can't be the only one that announced to my group of friends in high school I was going to the restroom, and they'd all immediately jump up and say, yeah, let's go, together. It's such a universal experience for girls and women, yet the comedians focus on it, because for people who haven't experienced it, the phenomenon is utterly baffling. Even when I think about it too hard, I can't help but wonder why we do that. Maybe it does warrant the age-old question, what are they doing in there anyway? <laughs> Believe it or not, women sticking together like this is backed up by science. I'll get into that in a bit, but the bottom line is that we are naturals at creating new connections, strengthening deep friendships, and in a big picture way, building community. Why does this matter? We're at a turning point in society where women are taking positions of power and it's fundamentally transforming the landscape in multiple sectors, public and private. I'm gonna focus on how women's influence affects the business world, because we're at a really interesting inflection point. Let me throw some numbers at you. The annual State of Women-Owned Businesses report, released with the number of women-owned businesses in the US, has more than doubled in the last 20 years. That's two and a half times the rate of the national average. And last year, Boston Consulting Group reported that startups founded by women generate 10% more revenue than startups founded by men. What does this tell us? First, we're killing it. <laughs> and second, we are shaping the culture and performance of the business world, not just because of who we are, but because of the way we do things. And the way we do things in the business world it's the same way we went to the bathroom in high school. We stick together. We build networks and communities, not just for ourselves, but for each other. And when I say community, I mean something specific. I want to differentiate this from a group of friends or a social movement or a conference like this one. I define a community as a group of people that gather online or in real life that feel a collective sense of belonging subscribe to shared values, get their emotional needs met, get their informational needs met, and experience authentic connections with new people. A community isn't stagnant. A successful one will grow organically and have its own life force, constantly transforming from, into something completely new from moment to moment. A community provides real value to people in an age of loneliness and picture-perfect Instagram feeds. A community is real. Clearly, I care a lot about this stuff. It's because I run a community strategy agency, so it's my job to assess the efficacy and impact of social networks. And I've noticed an interesting pattern. Whenever I come across thriving, impactful, well-executed communities built into brands, I find that they're run by women. And I don't think this is a coincidence. I'm here to tell you that women are innovating business, and it's in a way that's unique to us. The same kinds of communities that we participate in are the ones that we as business leaders are creating for our target markets. We are revolutionizing this trend that will transform how businesses are built, grown, and scaled. There are many real-world examples of women-led companies that are driving the rise of communities in business and strategies that you can take away from them today. Let's go back to the science that I mentioned that comes from schools of public health, social work, and psychology from all over the world. It turns out that women are natural connectors. And before I get into that, I want to acknowledge that really any kind of gender-based research is reductive in how it defines gender and tends to flatten the gender spectrum into a more binary definition. And until we can draw on research that studies identity and experience in a more nuanced way, this research is still useful and we can glean a lot from it. There's one study that shows that women bonding with each other has measurable impact. They took engineering students and put them in groups of either majority women, equal gender split, or majority men. And they found that when in groups of majority women, the female students participated more, 
had less anxiety, and had more confidence. This is significantly increased from being in groups of equal gender split. The presence of women helps women. But why? In social science, there's this concept called social cohesion. The official definition from Harvard Public Health researchers is the sense of solidarity and connectedness in a group. It's basically that feeling of belonging and support you feel in a group and the various benefits that you might experience from those connections. And it turns out that women are especially good at building social cohesion and empowering each other. And it looks pretty different from the way that men operate too. While empowered and connected men tend to become public leaders, empowered and connected women tend to lead inside an organization and make important decisions. Notice how one is more competitive and representing other people, and one is more collaborative and relating to other people. That's social cohesion at work. The researchers provide one possible explanation for the finding that relate to the power imbalance propagated by a patriarchal society. Systemic discrimination against women has manifested in lacking government representation and less access to high paying jobs. So we've had to get creative when it comes to finding resources and support. Women found it through each other when they couldn't find it elsewhere. And we've continued to develop a deep understanding of the importance of connecting with other women. Let's go back to that study on engineering students. STEM fields are male dominated, so it makes sense that we see this phenomenon really clearly. And what are some other fields or industries where women are underrepresented? Tech, finance, startups. How about business in general? The science validates that connection is our superpower. But to me, it's so much more than that. It's a tool. We use it to empower each other, but we also integrate it into our business strategy so they can have a really far-reaching impact and empower people that we'll never meet. One company I love that integrates community into their brand DNA is Dame Products. What do they sell, you ask? Vibrators and sex toys. <laughs> if you're feeling a bit of awkward energy in the room right now, that's exactly why they do what they do. They take something that is so private and personal, and they bring it out of the shadows to challenge the stigma surrounding sexual pleasure. They leverage their brand mission as a feminist cause that the collective can be actively part of, not just support from the sidelines. And besides their brand strategy and a lot of empowering and educational content, they also nurture a tight-knit community for Dame Labs. That's their community of product testers which sounds like a pretty fun job if you ask me. <laughs> By having this group of dedicated testers involved in product development, they advance the brand and their community focus. They create products that people actually want, which optimizes product market fit and consumer satisfaction. They're showing, not telling, that they want their audience to be part of the brand, which translates to powerful brand loyalty and they're actualizing their mission by facilitating conversations about sexuality and pleasurable sex in an open, accepting, empowering space that combats the taboo. And that's just their consumer-facing community strategy. They also build community in their industry by empowering their competitors to stand alongside them as collaborators. Their impact is powerful. Recently, Dame was working with the MTA, New York City subway system, to roll out advertisements that featured photos of their products, which come in odd shapes but don't appear sexual. After months of unanswered emails about final proofs, they were rejected by the MTA, which continues to show ads for erectile dysfunction medication using obviously phallic imagery. The double standard is real. So they partnered with Unbound, another sex toy company rejected by the MTA. They banded together in the fight to de-shame sex and educate the world. They launched the campaign Derail Sexism. <laughs> Dane sees other companies that might be viewed as competitors to be more like teammates that are facing identical problems. And the competitor turned collaborator model isn't unique to the sex tech industry. There's a community called Dreamers and Doers that centers itself around this idea. 
They're a network of trailblazing women that challenges the transactional and impersonal nature of startup culture. They encourage their members to share advice with each other and resources. They openly share brags that celebrate their accomplishments when that's usually not something that women are so vocal about. And they're radically vulnerable. They share stories about the difficulties of entrepreneurship and make people feel less alone. What ends up happening when you combine these elements is that you'll have people in the same industry, sometimes even leading companies with really similar products or mission statements. And when they're together supporting each other in this community, they end up doing better than if they hadn't directly supported their competitors. We truly are better together. And speaking of women-powered communities for entrepreneurs, another interesting example is the Riveter. Their founder, Amy Nelson, went to a bunch of co-working spaces and realized that women were an afterthought in their design and execution. She needed a space that fostered community and connection. That space didn't exist, so she created it. Within the walls of the Riveter, all kinds of connections and partnerships happen. A startup might go down the hall to chat to a PR agency, or someone could turn to the next chair and ask for advice about a resume. Their member base ends up creating a thriving ecosystem for community, collaboration, and innovation. And my favorite thing about it, it's not a women's co-working space. Because it's not a co-working space. The Riveter operates like a modern union that offers resources and community in addition to the co-working space. And it's not for women. At least it's not only for women. Since they opened, they've been open to all gender identities. Their slogan is built by women for everyone. Subscribing to the idea that feminism doesn't just benefit women, it lends equity for all. Right now their member base is 30% men and they'll see a 50-50 gender split as success. But what makes them remarkable isn't that men are included in their membership, it's why. The type of men who join are the ones who want to learn how to be better champions for women and other voices that belong in the conversation. They're eager to participate, learn from women, and contribute their own knowledge and mentorship. This ecosystem doesn't just fuel innovation, it builds allyship. And it's not just a good idea, it has real traction too. The company was founded two years ago and they already have 10 locations in seven cities with thousands of members. They've raised more than $20 million, and this year alone grew from 20 employees to 80. The idea is clearly resonating with people and already shaping a huge trend of women-led communities changing the world. So what can we learn from these companies? They all excel in industries that are normally competitive, transactional, and flashy. By rejecting the norms and promoting togetherness, authenticity, and collaboration, they know that there is more than enough market to go around, and that uplifting their peers instead of sabotaging them makes them look good. They're humble enough to want to learn from each other while being bold enough to lead. They give more than they take in hopes it will come back to them, and it does in such powerful ways because their hard work helps create a feminist world that everyone can benefit from, a world where business is infused with more empathy and connection. But here's the thing. Remember that statistic that I mentioned about women-founded startups generating more revenue? Here's another stat. The average investment made into a male-founded startup is $2.12 million. For female-founded, it's 935,000, less than half. So yes, we can create a feminist business world, but we can't do it alone. In order to support communities built by women for everyone, we need to shape an investing culture built for women by everyone. To the women who are watching, think of the women that you turn to in your life for support. When you reach out to them, you are manifesting your superpower. And to the men, I want to leave you with a couple questions. How can you learn from women and our strategies for building community? 
Which women can you turn to today and ask how you can be a better champion for us? Reach out to them. Ask them what they're working on. Bring them onto your team. This kind of collaboration will take you far. With your support, we won't need social cohesion to combat patriarchal oppression because there won't be patriarchal oppression. Social cohesion will just be one of the many tools in our arsenal. Together, we can create a world where we don't go to the bathroom together because we have to, but because we want to. Thank you.